Well, I'll, I'll start off. I'm going to speak to you about some of the significance of the Eurozone crisis for um, the monetary system, uh, for what it might tell us about it, and uh, any implications there might be for changes to it. Um, so the Eurozone crisis really consists of three interleaved crises, in my view. So one of the crises the, uh, I would attribute to uh, countries I call the unsalvageable. So that is uh, Greece and Cyprus. They are unsalvageable. So we, uh, you, you, people talk about those all of the time. I'm just going to assume <coughs> that what follows that um, they're going to be... Uh, uh, They'll default on an epic scale, and they will exit to the euro. Uh, there will be all kinds of internal chaos, authoritarianism, perhaps even civil war. So apart from that, I'm, because everybody else talks about that all the time, I'm not going to say much about them. Second, the second set of crises are what I call the banking crisis uh, countries. So the most obvious of the banking crisis countries are Ireland and Spain. Neither Ireland nor Spain had any kind of sovereign debt problem. They didn't have particularly indebted governments intrinsically. What they had was um, very large banking sectors relative to their economies. They then had governments that chose when their banking sectors became distressed to stand behind those banking sectors. And because of that, because it's the banking sector obligations those governments have taken on that now leave those as distressed sovereigns themselves in turn. So that's a different sort of a crisis from um, uh, others. The third set of crises, so ones that I would place under that category are, I normally place as Spain and um, Ireland and uh, Belgium. Now, Belgium doesn't have as large a banking sector relative to uh, GDP is the others, but it's the credit quality is quite poor. So I'll just stick that under there for now. Then the um, third set are, are, of crises countries in particular are the Portuguese and the Italians. Now I call these the competitiveness um, crisis countries. The fundamental problem with these countries is that they haven't grown for about a decade. And without growing, they've, they had quite large debts to begin with. The, uh, the Italians had about 120% debt to GDP in the 1990s, <coughs> fell down one stage, it got down to around about 104. But if you go uh, on for long enough without actually having any growth, then the burden of servicing a debt that's larger than 100% of GDP is going to be a real problem for you in the end. And people worry that if this were to go on for lo much longer, then there might be the risk of them deciding to bail on the whole thing. So <clears throat> those are the three sets of uh, crises. Fundamentally, I see them as a creation of the banking sector crisis and, to, and the recession associated with the banking sector crisis. Of course, in turn, one shouldn't uh, ignore the fact that the um, euro is a non-trivial contributor to the banking crisis in the first place because, of course, the euro was a, a key factor in reducing interest rates uh, to very low levels, much lower than historically normal in a number of countries. Again, we think particularly of Spain and Ireland, but there are other examples as well. They took interest rates right down. That was a factor encouraging uh, rises, particularly in household, but also to some extent corporate sector indebtedness. And so that was one factor in exacerbating at least the banking crisis. Um, the, uh, but more significantly, I see the banking crisis as being the creation of a number of um, weaknesses in the monetary order, which then the euro, uh, eurozone crisis, those flaws, the eurozone crisis is now going to expose in certain ways, which might take, make us in due course reconsider whether we really want to do things the way that we've done them up to now. So there are, um, are pro <coughs> capitalism, a capitalist order, <coughs> one of the classic critiques of capitalism was always that it was a scam. That no matter how pretty it might look um, in theory, in practice the way that it would work is that rich people would take control of the political order because of their wealth. That would then allow them, when there was any um, situation in which they might lose money or anything might go bad for them, they would then use their political power to, uh, to take money from the poor to keep themselves rich in those circumstances. That is precisely what has happened since um, 2007, all around the world. So fundamentally what's happened in this circumstance is that rich people have used their political power to impose taxes on poor people to keep them rich despite the errors that they made. And that is a, a reflection of not just something which happened then, it goes right back into the 1980s and even earlier. The concept that um, in the banking sector, you needed to have the government bail it, bail it out. If you put your money in a bank in any way, if you deposited money there, or you lent money as a bondholder to a bank, you were somehow absolved from normal risks. So when people lend money to a chip shop, or a retailer, or a manufacturer, they're all people who are taking risks. But if you lend money to a bank, then you were to lose your money. The government was somehow obliged in some strange way to come in and bail you out. That, that political impetus, that imperative to do that, 
is, lies at the heart of much that follows. Because once you believe that the government's always going to bail you out, then you're going to over, um, you're going to over in debt the banking sector. The banking sector is going to have incentives to take all kinds of risks. It will also have, have incentives to grow enormously relative to other sectors of the economy. And those are key factors. Those are the most fundamental factors in driving um, <coughs> problems in the banking sector. Now, one reason why they all, and whether it's a reason why or perhaps even a device for achieving this um, impetus, this pressure for bailouts, has been the, an unhelpful interleaving of three conceptually separate uh, um, factors in the financial sector. So one is lending money to a fractional reserve bank. I deposit money in a bank or I buy bonds in a bank. So that's one factor. A second factor is the medium of exchange. So the process by which, in practice, we actually swap stuff, we trade stuff for stuff, <coughs> the medium of exchange. And the third is the savings function. Now, these are three conceptually separate kinds of things. And in fact, if you went back far enough in time, they would be practically separate. If you went back a century or so, then you'd find that there were fractional reserve banks, which, which catered for people who wanted to lend money to them, do the kinds of things which they do. There were things called savings banks, which didn't, they didn't engage in fractional reserve activities. They were 100% backed by government bonds at the time or sometimes other things like gold and so on. So you could put your money in those if all you wanted to do was save. Of course, you got lower returns than you might at least some of the time in fractional reserve banks. But that was, you were safer if you put money there. And there was also the medium of exchange was not integrated with the banking sector. So, okay, there were checks and so on from earlier. But most of the time, most transactions occurred with cash. That was how you did it, or perhaps promises but promises that were not mediated through the banking sector directly. Now, in practice, those three things have all folded together. So we have the fractional reserve banks. The medium of exchange proceeds via a payment system which involves the banks. They own the banks or they are um, collaborators in the payment system. And uh, savings, the savings function, the savings banks in the UK, they existed right up to the mid-1980s. They've now all gone. Well, there's one teensy one in Scotland. But essentially, all savings banks have gone. What that's, what that's meant in practice was that if I'm a policymaker and I'm looking at the possibility of banks going bust, I'm no longer just worried about the normal kinds of issues arising from the collapse of a fractional reserve bank. I also have to worry about the collapse of my medium of exchange. And people are going to no longer be able to go, as people said, the ATMs are going to shut or the, your cards won't work in the shops. How is anybody actually going to buy any stuff practically if the banks go down? And, of course, we have the problem that there's savings function. There's a lot of money saved in fractional reserve banks, which may not have been actually seeking any to take any risk. It's just, you know, the iconic old granny's savings or the person who just sold one house and is wanting to, hasn't yet bought another and would keep the money under the bed if they could. Those kind of activities have all got mixed up together. And that creates pressure on the government to intervene, to save the banks. So one factor might be to work, if you can work out ways of disentangling those three aspects, that might help. This has also led to a confusion, a confusion in policymaker minds about the proper goals of regulation in general and of the financial sector in particular. I mean, is it that I'm stopping crises occurring? Because if a crisis occurs, a bank might go bust and then I'm going to have to make some choices about the medium of exchange or whatever. Or is it, am I trying to stop a slump? Am I trying to counter some kind of market failure, what, what market failure it is may not be altogether clear, or is it the kind of traditional central banking roles? Those kind of things have all got muddied in people's heads. Um, uh, that's, also, uh, that's also been particularly exacerbated in the Eurozone by a confusion um, that's arisen because of very different cultural presumptions as you combine a monetary system. Italy and Spain, until the late 1960s, had nationalized retail banking. It wasn't a private sector activity at all. In fact, state banks, state retail banks um, continued very late in Italy. Um, if you, uh, and, of course, you have the French model, where even today it's conceived of that the, that the bank and the state are all, almost one and the same kind of thing. So once, if you combine those with other sorts of models of banking, particularly once you start to stick those cultural presumptions onto a kind of theoretical notion that dominates, which is more sort of libertarian, then you're going to end up with all kinds of confusion and the opportunity for pressure to do things like bail things out. 
At the same time, macroeconomic policy became focused on an aspect, a central aspect of fractional reserve banking, namely the activities of the central bank. That it became divorced, though, so monetary policy became focused on that, and then the central bank, partly because of that, started to be divorced from its traditional role as lender of last resort to, um, to the fractional reserve banks and prudential overseer of them. We developed instead a concept via the, um, <coughs> via the Basel process, whereby some people in some committee, who knows where, they set some rules, and then somebody else who has nothing to do with the day-to-day -day management or the central, of central banking then enforces those rules. You can have some agency, like the FSA or something like that. So what you have is a, diff a completely alien new concept of what, it's, what it is that you're doing in, in um, financial regulation. That, as I say, becomes confused with these other things. The one other thing's going on, so you have this monetary policy, which is then enacted by something which is divorced from its traditional role, the monetary policy then becomes fixated on a particular, in a particular place, a particular kind of activity. If you have a crisis of some sort, suppose that, suppose that there's some need for change in society, in the economy, there are four broad ways you could uh, react to that. You could just accept it, you could try to smooth the transition path, you could try to fight it, or you could try to accelerate it. And it's not altogether obvious which of these you want to do on any one particular occasion. Until the 1920s, and to, um, right through into the early 30s, there was a serious thought that one of the, the a plausible thing to do when you have a crisis might be to accelerate it. But if, you have, if there's some problem in the economy, if you can just cut the, cut the dead wood away quickly, then everything could heal faster. This was the sort of Andrew Mellon liquidationist thought. A lot of people, when they talk about the 30s in the US, seem to imagine it's laissez-faire, not, not a bit of it. They were actively seeking to accelerate the process of liquidation in the US in the 1930s. That, and they did so under the encouragement, in fact, of Austrian and, to some extent, Swedish economists. That completely discredited the Austrian movement, in fact, in the way that, uh, because of the subsequent developments in the US. But it seems to me that if on this occasion we find that we get massive sovereign defaults, perhaps in multiple countries, if we were to have, for example, a collapse of the euro altogether, 10% further um, contraction in the UK, maybe 20% in the Eurozone, even after, even after the gargantuan sums which were put into fighting or smoothing the transition, I think that people might revisit that again. They might say the concept of smoothing has failed. In the same way as in the 20s they said the concept of accelerating the process has failed and we shouldn't try that again. They may now say, well, the concept of smoothing has just been a disaster. There will be circumstances under which you don't want to do that either. I think there's a genuine possibility they might revisit that question. Um, the one other thing that's related to that is they developed the rather odd idea, uh, and this is very recent, I think, that the optimal notion of monetary policy is to achieve the lowest interest rate you can, which is compatible with an inflation target. If you went back historically, we had an idea that there was something called the natural rate. So you may have heard of the natural rate of unemployment, right? Friedman talking about that. Well, he was actually, that's a sort of allusion to a much older idea of, a, a, of an economist called a Vixel from the 19th century. And Vixel had the idea that there was a natural rate of interest. So there was an equilibrium rate of interest for the economy. And that it was damaging to the economy if you were below it, as well as if you were above. And we've forgotten that sort of thought, that there was a problem for the economy if your interest rates are too low. I think that we, may need, to, that we need to discover that again. So there are all kinds of revisions that we, that, that we should have, I think. I think we need to disentangle, we need to have special, we need to resurrect savings banks with institutions. We need to find ways of isolating the payment mechanism. We need to um, find ways of insulating government from the temptation to bail out fractional reserve banks. I also think that with the possibility of Greek and Cypriot chaos, even war, we may well see the apotheosis of the smoothing concept in certain places and a revision of that. Without the concept of monetary activism, people may look again at possibilities like whether they should use commodity standards. I want to do monetary activism particularly if I have a currency which is just controlled, is um, without an anchor, fiat currency determined by discretion by the state. I think that we may find that in some places at least, perhaps particularly for newer currencies coming into the monetary order, the Brazilians or the Chinese or something, they won't want to do the same things we've done in the past. <coughs> They're much more likely to consider metallic and 
other commodities as ways of doing things in the future. Andrew, thank you.